you go. All good. Okay, so I'm gonna very briefly introduce Cole Carruthers, our featured artist of November. And then I'm gonna hand the floor over to him to give his talk and show some images and um, get a little discussion going. Um, if you all have questions, I'm happy to help field those. You can just sort of raise your hand like this or take your um, self off mute and um, ask away. So let's get started. Um, let's see here. So we are so thrilled, of course, to feature Cole Carruthers as our featured artist for November 2023. Um, Cole first came to Aix-en-Provence in 1969, where he took art classes from Leo Marschutz and Billy Wayman in the back room of the Papatry Michel. Um, after finishing college and working a bit in the United States, he returned to Aix for the second summer session of the, at the time, new Leo Marschutz School of Painting and Drawing in 1973. Um, so stay here to hear more about Cole's story and see some of his um, his works. And with that, I will hand things over to Cole. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Rose. Uh, how do I get back to my screen sharing <laughs> with the images that I have? <laughs> Yes, so if you just go to the bottom of your screen and click on the green button that says share screen, uh, you'll be able to share your screen okay. that way. Uh, let's see, I'll put on the share screen. Okay, there we go. Yeah, there it is. And I click on the Chrome And button. then I think you'll select your Google Chrome, exactly. Okay. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Now we can see okay. it. Um, <clears throat> Just kind of as a preface to whatever goes on today, and it may be out of control, I don't know. Um, I just put together a, a bunch of folders with images uh, in each, and uh, they're kind of broken down by topics. And so I, the first folder is just, I guess, will be kind of my monologue. But if anyone wants to interrupt at any time, uh, you're more than welcome. It'll make me feel comfortable that we're actually uh, having a dialogue rather than me just sort of rambling on uh, incoherently. So uh, just to get this started, I'll bring up an image. It's a self-portrait with a picture of where I'm holding myself um, in a photograph. It was taken, I guess, when I was probably about <clears throat> three years old. And there's a circus picture in the background uh, behind me. Um, I did this uh, as a bartering opportunity with another friend of mine, an artist um, who also did a self-portrait. Um, his is quite different, radically different actually. And um, nonetheless, I just thought this might be a place to start it because it, for me, it at least identifies that uh, I like the, the fact that uh, that painting in the background suggests uh, that either life is a circus or maybe uh, being an artist is a circus. But uh, nonetheless, that's kind of where it is. And um, let me see if I can move on to the next picture. Um, so the playfulness that I uh, consider as being part of the artist's life in the circus, I often will uh, in my studio, at least, um, come up with some strange ideas. Uh, this was one of them. Uh, this is a piece of sheet metal where I created cutouts uh, of my clothing that I would usually wear in the studio, and I painted them onto the sheet metal, which had a ground of, uh, of auto primer. Um, actually, somebody bought this from me, and, and he asked that I cut out all the pieces, which kind of drove me crazy because that wasn't my idea. But nonetheless, I I went for the money and uh, cut the pieces out. So this is uh, at least the first showing of the cuts. Um, and in being playful about it, this was me without the bathrobe on. So I painted a fig leaf on, my, on myself. Um, so it's just kind of a game. Uh, but I often come up with funky ideas in the studio. And so I'm just going to run through some images that kind of reveal the uh, the degree to which my mind will roam uh, 
this one's called Cats Away. Uh, it was a painting I did back in maybe about 2007 or eight. Um, it's got a lot of Trump lawyer type things in it, but uh, there are also aspects to it which are um, quite playful, such as the masking tape um, over on the right hand side near the upper corner, uh, just kind of floating there. Or if you'll notice down by my easel, there's a piece of tissue paper, or it looks like tissue paper that's covering up a ladder and the paint bucket appears to be spilling itself uh, on the uh, surface of the painting. Um, so I'll just run through these rather quickly. Um, I've often kind of enjoyed surrealist images. This is one by Merritt Oppenheim. Um, obviously it's not the kind of coffee cup anybody would want to put to their mouth. Um, so in considering that, I one time participated in a fundraising event um, for, um, uh, it was called, um, I think it was Caracol, which was to help uh, people who were suffering from AIDS. And so we were uh, giving, everyone was given a bowling pin to, to work with. And for some reason, I just felt it looked like a, a drumstick or a turkey leg or whatever. So I painted a painted the bowling pin like a turkey leg and then took it to the uh, local Kroger's supermarket and asked them to uh, wrap it in um, as, as if it were on the meat shelf in, with the foam tray and the plastic wrap. Um, subsequently, I found out when uh, when the the event occurred and this piece was purchased by somebody else, they took it out of the wrapping, which kind of upset me because I felt that the wrapping was actually part of the piece. Nonetheless, that's that's what happens. Um, now I'm just gonna go through images of the studios I've uh, had, and I've moved my studio probably six times over the last 40 years. And uh, that's often a, an event that uh, brings with it um, a lot of pain and and uh, physical effort. This was uh, the second studio I had in Ohio uh, when I moved back. Uh, oh, may I interrupt? How large are these? If I um, okay, the, this painting is actually uh, about five feet by eight feet. Wow. Um, okay. Thank and it's made you. out of panels that are joined together. It's actually it's based on a on a um, a spiral curve that's uh, called the Fibonacci sequence, and uh, that's kind of a the the nautilus shell and the, the pine cone, the sunflower seeds. All those things have uh, uh, a lot of things in nature. Even galaxies have a have a feature of mathematical. Uh, proportion to them that is um, remarkable. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a sequence of growth, uh, starting with just one square, and then you double it, then you add uh, one to that, and then you add, uh, you add, um, the sequence goes one, one, two, three, and then five, you add the last two squares in size to get the next square. So after the three comes the five, and so mm -hmm. five plus three makes eight, and then eight plus five would make 13. And so it creates a, a golden rectangle, okay? It's something that the Greeks came up with. Anyway, this was my studio. Uh, it was a walk-up third floor apartment that I rented for about uh, $65 a month back in 1980. Um, and it was in the downtown core of Cincinnati. Um, after another move, I moved back to my house for a period of time, and then I took a job in Covington, Kentucky, which is just across the river. So I rented space in a warehouse, and uh, this was a painting I did of the interior of that space. I've got a few other pictures that show um, aspects of, of this studio. This is uh, the studio when I was kind of fully vested into its space. I was there for about eight years. Um, during this time, I also had a job 
administrating at an arts foundation for um, for classes for children and adults. So I sneak away from that job and go to the studio, uh, which was only about a mile from the, where the foundation was. Um, this was a large painting I did in that studio, and it shows a lot of the objects that were in this in the studio space. But the the actual painting is kind of an invented one in terms of of um, it wasn't set. I didn't set things up like a still life, but I did observe things lying around in the studio and sort of brought them all together into the painting. Um, again, you can see certain lines going through the painting that that show. Um, where uh, panels were joined, these are all on plywood panels um, that I would prepare with a, a, a hide glue and then use a, a, a homemade gesso, which was basically uh, whiting and, and, and more of the hide glue sort of warmed up like a heavy cream soup and you'd paint on layers and then sand it after it had dried. Um, well, this was one of my other studios. I um, I, I left the uh, the warehouse in Covington after, um, shortly after I um, quit the job I had administrating because uh, in that warehouse there were other spaces on the top floor where I was, and they were having rave parties up there. And it was a 19th century manufacturing building with wood floors, and I would walk into the into the main floor and go to my space and I'd see cigarette butts just crushed on the floor and I felt it was destined to catch fire. So with the craziness that was going on there, I left and um, eventually I came to this space, which was uh, the top floor again in an old 19th century building. Uh, it had been a, um, a mason's lodge. So I set the studio up it was a really big space and I set the, uh, the, this first room kind of as a sitting area and a display area. And then I um, worked in the main room and these are just pictures of, of that space. Um, I really thought I was in heaven uh, having so much room and all these windows going around. It was incredible. The unfortunate thing was that the, uh, the person I was renting this from had been a student of mine at the Art Academy of Cincinnati back in 1981, and he never showed up for class, so I gave him a D. And uh, so years later, he owns this building, and I'm renting from him, and uh, he turned out to be about as bad a landlord as he was a student. So my life in this space only lasted a year, <laughs> but it was it was a good area. to It was a good place to, to work because I had lots of room. These are some of the, you can see the scale of the paintings. Some of them are quite large. Others you'll find later on are, are quite small. That's the display area. And I, I built these, uh, this kind of frame like grid in the, that would hang from the ceiling and put on some track lighting that I got through a, um, secondhand store or something like that. And I actually started doing pop-up shows on my own um, because I wasn't really affiliated with any any galleries. So I would um, frequently just take a weekend and, and put together a, an exhibition and try and make some money selling some work. Uh, this was the the bathroom that was on the floor and it had a couple sinks on it in it um i so i did a painting of this um you know i could actually work from life from study uh this is about a six and a half foot tall painting um it's incredible incredible light uh in um, midwestern ohio uh, i'm in the southwest corner uh on clear days, even like today, when uh, when the air is cold, the light is incredibly bright and crisp and uh, really exciting. Uh, this was a Western exposure, so it was an afternoon uh, kind of situation. And that's sort of the finished piece. 
Well, this is the studio I am in now, which is my garage. Uh, it used to be a, an old carriage house and I tore out half of the second floor ceiling or the ceiling uh, to the second floor so that I'd actually have more headroom and light. And uh, I've been here in this space on and off since 1980. But when I finally decided I had had enough of landlords, I um, I kind of made changes to the interior structure so that I have more more headroom in case I wanted to do larger work. But uh, but it's a smaller space, so it's pretty crowded. If ever anyone's seen a picture of Francis Bacon in his studio, uh, it's it's hilarious because it looks like he doesn't have more room than just the stool that he's sitting on to to paint uh, because he's got so much stuff around and I'm beginning to feel like <laughs> I have the same condition. Um, well, that's, that's all I had for the intro. And um, so uh, at this point, I'll just give you some topics that I, that I have. Um, and if anybody would like to um, hear from one of these folders, uh, just speak up. I've, I've got a folder on X, which is perhaps something everybody might want to uh, see, but um, I also have a folder that relates to my connections with art history, what it means to me. Um, I've done a lot of paintings of urban uh, landscapes. So I have a folder on city motif. Um, I have a folder on use of the dot matrix printer that I've brought into my studio as a as a painting tool. Um, I have a lot of images of mixed media. Um, I, I've often used singular objects in many paintings. So I, um, I've got these beautiful pots from Pier 1 that appear in probably half a dozen or more paintings. And so I thought that's an interesting kind of motif of one object. Uh, and I got another motif. It's not a motif, but a, a garment that I wear. It's just a, a insulated plaid shirt because a lot of the spaces that I've rented over the years have not had great heat. So uh, this plaid shirt is figured into a lot of my work, uh, both as, uh, you know, a way of me keeping from being splattered with paint. But uh, when it's on a chair or something, sometimes it shows up in a painting. And lastly, uh, one um, subject matter that I'm often drawn to is the connection between an interior space and the exterior by by use of a window as a uh, as a means to integrate those two spaces and that affords me the opportunity to investigate structure which is always something I, I like in my paintings and um, by having the the window I connect to landscape outside so where there's the rational uh, nature of structure in, in the interior space and possibly even some still life in the interior space by having the window, the exterior light and the landscape outside, I can uh, go from something that's a little bit more rigid and tight into something that's freer and more organic, which of course landscape is, is very much so. Um, I think, the last thing I'll say before I'd like to open it up to uh, whatever anyone cares to ask is that um, the importance of Leo and Billy and Sam in my life was really to kind of set me in a direction of of believing in in the pursuit of art as as a as a lifetime's work and. Um, you know, through that experience of being an ex, I really came to realize that the visual world is is an extremely com complex but exciting place to to be and to work from what you see and to try and understand it and to, in some manner, um, express my relationship to the visual world has. Um, has been been my life, and uh, I I think it really began that first year I was an ex, and it 
you know, it's, it's a very strong um, bit of um, experience to live with for 40 years and still believe that it's, um, it's there and it's not finished. <laughs> it never will be finished. So with that, I'd be happy to uh, let anyone ask a question and maybe I could reach into my pile of images and, and we could have a discussion. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Cole. Sure. Remember everybody that if you're if you're wanting to um, say something, you're on mute. So make sure to unmute yourself before you start speaking. Cole, maybe we could start with that beautiful thing you just said about your time in X. Maybe we could start by looking at some of the images from X. Well, okay, I don't have a lot. Um, That's okay. <laughs> um, and some of these people may have seen when they visited the Marshoots page for the, you know, the, the community and, and the artist of the month, which uh, is coming to an end today. Um, so anyway, <laughs> this was, this was, I think the first, one of the first oil paintings I ever did. And uh, as I explained in my um written comments um, to you. I It was at the um, guidance of, of, of Billy and Leo to pick out an image uh, from the bins of, of reproductions in the Papa Tree Michel and, and do a copy of it. And, you know, the, the notion of learning from copies uh, uh, is, is so ingrained in me that while I don't do a lot of copying anymore, I do an awful lot of looking at other artists' work, um, both um, past artists and, and living artists. And I believe that uh, without them, I, I would be lost. So this was, um, this was the first experience I had with oil paints um, under the tutelage of uh, Leo Marshutes and Billy Wayman. Subsequently, I tried to take on landscape. This was um, on the road out to where I had a small room uh, in a beautiful farm building. Uh, these were like 1970, uh, 71. And then I returned a year after I went back to the US, finished college, and then worked for a year after college before returning to X uh, for another stay of about a year. Um, this was probably the second go round. Uh, I've lost a lot of the work over the years. I don't know where it's gone, but uh, I think this was probably done in uh, maybe 1973. This is out near Bo Recoya where uh, Sam lived. Um, and so that is, I think, looking towards Bo Rakoya, and that's a irrigation ditch or something in the foreground. When the weather was hot in X, we'd, I'd go down there and just walk around in the irrigation ditch because the water was cool. There wasn't a place to swim at the time. Uh, this is Bo Rakoya. And uh, this was Les Mille, which is, uh, out, uh, I can't exactly, I'd say it maybe was uh, a little bit west or southwest of X. And after reading and looking at Leo Marschutz's website, I realized that what I had painted was the exact place where in 1941, or maybe it was in the late 30s, but he was interned at Les Mille. And uh, Fortunately, he was able to uh, get released from it, at which point he realized this could happen again. So he went and lived in the woods behind the Chateau Noir. Uh, but for me, this was uh, just an interesting uh, kind of old 19th century factory. It's a, it's a tile factory for roof, roofing tiles. And it was in the snow. So that explains why there's so much white around it. I just didn't bother to paint the snow. I left the uh, canvas to, to do the snow effect for me. So that's all I have on, on my X work, really. Uh, not much, but um, there you have it.
Beautiful. Thank you. Sure. Does anyone else on the call have a preference to where Cole goes next in his folders? Alan? Yes, I would like to. I mean, there's so many of them I'd like to go to, but I, the city, I've seen some of your city. I'd love to look at your city paintings and how okay. you how you worked your city paintings, even in relation, I don't know if you can, but and talk about the art, the influence, the art history influence in relation to your city, city paintings. Is that something we can do? Well, um, yeah, I mean, there's city uh, landscape, urban landscape has been, uh, I'd say, with us certainly since uh, the Impressionists. I mean, you, you see it in, in the work of, uh, of Monet, Pizarro, um, especially, uh, perhaps, I'm not sure if Degas fits in with that, but uh, definitely Monet and Pizarro. And uh, often it's with Pizarro, you get those overhead views where he's up in some building and he's uh, painting the streets below. So um, then there are artists today who have been doing city paintings. And, and the one I think of principally is, as a um, inspiration to me is um, Antonio Lopez Garcia, who is a, a Spanish paper, pa painter. He's probably almost 85 now or so. And um, he's, he's a remarkable artist. So anyway, I'll just go through. And I, in, in these city paintings, I've included the sources. Um, I'm not a plein air painter. I I tried that uh, in the winter time years ago when I first came back from X, and uh, it was so brutally cold in Massachusetts where I was at the time that I just figured I ought to try and figure a different way of approaching landscapes uh, rather than uh, being out in the in the harsh air of uh, of winter time. So anyway, what you'll see are paintings that I've done from um, um, actual, you know, on-site location where I was in buildings like Pizarro might have been or Lopez Garcia today might have been. Uh, sometimes I'm able to paint as in this one. Uh, this, this was um, pretty much, I used the photograph to kind of, uh, you know, help with the construction of it, but I was able to actually observe at the same time. So, um, so by having the photograph and then ob observing, I I could st the buildings, of course, wouldn't move, but the cars would come and go. So for that, I relied on the photograph. But in terms of the light and the the textures of the of the surfaces of uh, the foliage or the grass or the gravel, the railroad tracks, uh, the trees everything was there. So I was able to work with it um, by actually um, painting from from the window view. Uh, in this one, this is a, a pretty complicated one of the city. So for this, I took a lot of photographs and, and brought it back in, into the studio. And what I would do is I would, this painting is probably uh, four and a half feet long and maybe uh, four feet high. And uh, the way I would work is I would grid my panel um, proportionately. And then I would, uh, if I was using a photograph, I would, in Photoshop on my computer, I'd break it down into 16 separate units uh, to conform to the grid of the, um, of the panel that I was working on. And then I would freehand from that point on. I didn't project or any of that stuff. It was just, I'd use the photograph to give me guidance. And then I would um, just try and make sense of it as best I could uh, through my drawing and my uh, efforts to work with color uh, and the paint. Um, I use liquid medium a lot, which is I can use to thin the paint. So it works like a glaze. and. In that manner, it helps me to kind of achieve a, a sort of luminescence uh, to the atmosphere of, of the landscape. So I try to be as truthful as I can to the experience of seeing it. And, um, and because these are local to me, I can often revisit them even while I'm working on the painting. 
Um, and this I took from a, a high rise building in downtown Cincinnati. I went to the building on the, on New Year's Day and you could go into the building because it was a basically a, an office building. And I took the elevator. They have an observation deck on the top floor, but that was closed. But I took the elevator up as high as I could go and the doors opened and there were these guys doing drywall work for the entire floor of a future law office. And I said, do you mind if I walk around? And they said, no, just watch out. You know, you don't hurt yourself. So I had the whole, uh, it was probably the 35th floor of a building to walk around in and, and look at the landscape through the windows. So that's what this one uh, resulted in. Oh, um, I'm dying to ask, how, how long, how long does it take you to do one of these paintings? How long do you? Well, I, Alan, I would work on, I would work on this painting and the others at the same time. But um, if it was a big enough painting, I could work on parts of it or all of it. I mean, I, I, I wish I had an image of something that would show it in progress. Uh, but that was one thing I learned through Billy and Sam is to try and work in the all over to keep the painting, keep its momentum going in a kind of unified way by, you don't just, for me, I wouldn't just work in the left hand corner and, and start moving sure. outward. I'd launch in and, you know, it might be driven by the color on my brush. So I'd, um, I'd often work on these paintings for, for weeks at a time and, and they would go through a lot of revision just to try and get things right. Um, so, you know, this is the painting that came from that photograph. Um, and it's, you know, this is, again, is that winter light that I have here in Ohio that's just remarkably clear and, and strong and uh, vibrant. So I'll, I'll run through these. Uh, this was a more recent view I took. And uh, in this, I'm starting to loosen up a little bit more. Um, I find as I get older, I'm happier just winging away with the paint and not you know, trying to uh, be too hard edged about things. The, the funniest remark that I I heard from uh, the person who has this painting is that when their grand one of their grandchildren came over and looked at the painting, um, she or he was able to pick out a McDonald's emblem on, in the landscape. Which, if you look at the end of the of the viaduct, just above the viaduct, you can kind of see the golden arches there. And uh, like I said, when I work, work on these, I this is a 48 inch by 48 inch painting. And um, I guess there were probably 16 square units to it. And uh, so in one of the, each of these sections, you know, the, a square unit might be, uh, well, 48 by 48. I don't know what the size of that would be. Um, uh, divided by, well, 16 into 48 goes four times. So uh, four inches across and four inches high. So four by four units were, you know, the way I kind of chopped up this landscape to just to try and deal with the structure of it. I'm, that may not make sense to people, but um, I'll be happy to explain it <laughs> to you if you want to email me. Um, yeah, but when I yeah, when you split it up, would you work um, the four squares? Sort of, you'd work in one. Would you work the four squares because you said you brought them up together? Would you work the four squares at the same time, kind of? Well, like you can see in the sky, I might be able to run across that with a certain amount of of color that's uh, just mixed up, you know, like a blue, a maybe a cerulean or manganese or something like that, and paint it in. But as I get into the more intricate parts of the structure of the landscape, I have to pay attention to what's going on from one unit into the next, because otherwise it's going to get pretty wobbly and, and kind of uh, chaotic. So I was careful to, to try and understand the connections between uh, the square on the left, 
what was to the right of it or what was above it or below it. But once I had it laid down, I was it it was there in such a way that I could then paint it in in a more um, cohesive and and exuberant kind of way. Um, yeah. I, I am, I'm not, you know, I was given a, a model steamboat when I was about 10 years old and I tried to put it together without the directions. And, and it was, so as I was putting it together, I decided I wanted to paint it. And my mother had some, uh, Ver um, I get vermilion oil paint. And so I painted this plastic steamboat with vermilion oil paint and I was trying to put it together without directions. That's my problem. I'm kind of ADD. So um, you know, my point is, is that in something like this, I, I still have a certain amount of ADD going on. I, I can work with the units, but I'm impatient about it. I want to get to painting the overall. So I pay attention as closely as I can. And then I just get into it for the, the atmospheric qualities of the paint, you know, like that gray landscape in the back. I mean, that's a lot of layers of very thin paint. It's uh, sort of working in a way to suggest the distance and to suggest the the condition of the light on on those hillsides of of trees and you know the the air that's between me and 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 the, the distance that sort of thing. Um, right, I'm taken with the. I don't want to take up a bunch of time, but the reds, the way the reds work in this painting, you know, as you go around the different places in the painting and that little red square that's down in the bottom left corner in relation to all the other reds i'm just wondering when that came in terms of how that works i couldn't tell you <laughs> it's i mean the, the reds you know i might have a limited palette alan uh that would definitely be something i would uh i would be conscious of because uh, i did you know there there is uh a cohesive quality to the brick colors in these buildings, wow. even though they're of a certain age, they may often have come from the, the same um, company that was firing the bricks. And, and so the clay color is not unlike from one building to the next, then some of them may have paint on it. But, you know, like that red, that brighter red down in the corner, you may see it again where it's been tinted or, or, toned or shaded somehow um, so, interesting though, that, that little red dot is like the strongest where it is in the painting is very interesting to me in terms of all the other reds it's like this bright red strongest red in the painting in relation to the movement of all the reds in the back it's incredible yeah well um you know uh the uh saturation of a color its intensity um or its warmth, whatever you want to, however you wanted to break it down in terms of its features, um, certain colors will advance and others will recede. And of course, while the red might in one of these buildings in the back, further back in the distance, might be the same in the same range as that brighter red in the foreground, it's been conditioned by. Um, by tonality, you know, by the addition maybe of a complement or or a little bit of a blue to it or or a thinner application of it. Um, that's how that's how they go uh, for me. Um, I don't know if I'm going in the right direction. Let me see. Well, I think that's yeah, that's all of the city paintings. So, um, well, I. How about art history? Would you want to see my connections to art history? <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, I don't know. Anyway, okay, we were talking about the red color of bricks. Well, this was another this was another uh effort of mine to satisfy um the call for uh you know community service. So it was a uh artists were asked to do something with bricks for breast cancer. So I have three daughters and, uh, you know, I believe that uh, breast cancer is a horrible thing. Um, you know, men seem to get get a pass on this sort of thing. Although 
not always. Anyway, I so I found two bricks and, and I discovered that they had a softness about them. And I thought, well, I'll just paint th the three, or I'll just uh, chisel out the three graces on these soft uh, red bricks that are all over Ohio. So, um, so I simply, you know, took the image from um, Roman or um, I guess it was probably uh, a Roman image, but it might have been Greek. Nonetheless, you know, the three graces has been with us ever since, uh, you know, a um, couple hundred years AD, I suppose, or BC even. Um, it's possibly from uh, Pompeii murals that I got the, the grouping of the three graces. And so I just took kind of transcribed uh, the three graces onto the brick and started carving them out with a straight safety razor, you know, the kind you'd put into a paint scraper. And that's all I did. Just uh, cut it, you know, shaved the, the soft brick away to create the figures. Um, so I look a lot at, um, at art history. Um, in my traveling, I'm constantly interested with, uh, you know, the, ever since being in X or being in Europe for that matter. Um, this was a building in Arezzo and there are all these amazing kind of medallions that are right on the exterior of the building. So uh, somehow it, it made me want to adapt it. And this is actually a, a piece of fired clay that I um, enhanced with uh, tape. I took lead type that I had in a shoebox. Um, and I would press the lead type into the clay. And then after it was fired, I painted this image uh, into the opening that I had left uh, to create kind of a window effect. But it, it seemed to harken back to that. I mean, that's it just stayed with me, uh, the fascination, I guess. Um, let's see. Well, here again, uh, this was in Sicily. Uh, I went there. With each of my daughters, I I tried before they um, graduated from college. I I wanted to travel just alone with my daughter, and so with my youngest daughter before she went to nursing school, we uh, took about three weeks and we went from Rome down to Sicily and back, and then uh, she stayed on a little bit longer, and I flew back to the U.S. But in Sicily, there's a, a town pretty much in the center of the island called uh, um, I think it's Aramina or something like that I, I can't remember that clearly now but it has the Casale Romano which was a 400 AD uh, palace that was decorated with mosaics uh, it was, and it's a it's a UNESCO world site it's just unbelievable um, when I got back later on I uh, found myself applying some of that, plus a, a time that we spent going through Pompeii on our way south from Rome. And so I did this small painting. It's kind of a mixed media thing, but uh, you can sort of see the figure to the right is not unlike uh, that figure with the, with the ball um, standing to the right of the column. So this is this is a mixed media painting. It's uh, it's on panel and it's done with uh, some plaster, uh, some wood molding, like from a frame uh, up at the top that creates that kind of capital like effect to the to the window. And um, that's how I appropriate it from art history, you know, and from what's been given to us in, in the heritage of visual arts. Um, let's see. Well, here is another instance. Uh, we were, uh, this gallery that I'm now working with wanted to put together a show to commemorate, uh, Van Gogh, I think it was. So, um, being kind of up for the game of it, I, I decided, okay, I'll do something with this painting. So, um, this is a gypsy caravan, uh, it's probably done outside of Arl by Van Gogh. Uh, this is my caravan painting. Uh, it was a kind of a music concert in Northern Michigan. 
And uh, you can see Bob Marley's on the blanket there, but um, you know, there we are, 20th century gypsies. Um, this is a, a chiesa in Bologna, Italy, and it's got these beautiful uh, Della Robbia medallions in the exterior of, of the facade of the church. And uh, there was a period of time when I was had access to a kiln, and, a, and so I'd roll out sl slabs of clay and, and do different kinds of textural things to them, and then I'd paint them. So um, this was pretty much just a, a take on on that. Um, but it's it's a it's a bisque fired red clay, and I'm, I that's as far as I went with it. I didn't glaze it; I just painted over it, and then. Uh, I found out in Florence at the San Marco, they actually had some examples of bisque fired clay with painting on them that was down in the, not in the uh, actual cells of the monastery where Fra Angelico painted, but there were slabs of this sort that they had uh, done decorative kind of work on. Uh, they were down in the museum of the San Marco. Um, this is a, a painting by Antonio Lopez Garcia. And um, I just find it to be extraordinarily interesting, you know, for the textural qualities, the, the light, the, the, the feel of, 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 of the surfaces, the objects, it, the simplicity, the structural integrity of it, um, the fact that it's, just quotidian objects. It's not some kind of gold pot with extraordinary tulips in it. I mean, it's just your everyday life. So I'm drawn to that. And uh, this was a, uh, a sink in one of the studios I had that I uh, just set up right in the bathroom and painted it. Um, then Lucian Freud has done sinks. Uh, I find him to be kind of an interesting painter. So I'm gonna do a nitty gritty sink in one of the, this was in the uh, warehouse building. I had a studio in in Covington. So I set up and painted this. This is what came of it. Um, this is Giotto's, uh, Scrivenji Chapel in, in Padua. Um, I got, I had a chance to see it ever so briefly. And when I did see it, it was, they had all kinds of uh, scaffolding in there because they were photographing it. So I didn't have a view quite as pristine as that. But uh, I bought a book on Giotto and that's what that image came from, as did this one. And uh, somehow they ended up in this. Um, this is kind of a, a little bit of a mixed media painting. Um, there's, it's an odd format, of course, but I, I built uh, the, um, that triangular shaped um, tr truss, I guess you'd call it, or whatever, freeze-like uh, triangle at the top uh, onto the wood panel. And uh, I don't know how even I, got to this one, uh, it just evolved on its own. But I think uh, what some of my interest in using different materials and and going to different sources, not just for art history, but uh, just as a matter of, of having the delight in, in building as well as painting things comes from the fact that I did scenery design while I was in high school. And uh, so, you know, because of that, I, I just have always enjoyed the the dramatic quality of, of imagery and, and also uh, something about the proscenium, the focus, um, the fact that it's, uh, it takes you into another world. And uh, this was a photograph by Brassai of Picasso's studio in 1945, just after liberation. And, uh, I just thought it was wonderful. And I thought, why don't I try and paint this, but give it color? So that that was my improv. 
Um, I call the painting E.C. Kosbech, which is the uh, Afghan hound lounging on the floor in the in the sunlight there. That's about six feet high, actually, that painting. Oh, Cole, um, would you, when you did that painting, would you look at the, it's interesting, the translation of the black and white to the color. Did you look at the, did you set the photograph up and sort of paint from it, or did you paint from your uh, memory of it? No, I, I had the, I have a brass photograph book, so I just kept the book there and I just looked at it. Wow. I didn't, I didn't grid this off or anything. I just kind of freehanded, uh, you know, looking at the photograph. I mean, I, I used the dimensions of the photograph for its proportions so that I built a panel that was, that correlated to the, uh, to that shape of rectangle. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, you know, it was actually, I would say, it wasn't really a black and white photograph. It was sort of a sepia tone photograph. But, um, you know, having been an ex and 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 just paid attention when it, whenever I could, even in Ohio, to to texture on uh, in what's around me, um, you know, I just figured I can handle, I can figure out what will look good for me. And um, that's how I approached it. So, but it's so interesting because you backed up a little bit on the, with the painting, you backed up a little bit on the sort of the dark lighting effect of the black and white. I mean, it has, yeah. I mean, you have the lighting effect, but it's not as strong in the painting. It's really interesting what you did. Well, yeah, I, I kind of went into the, uh, with Brass Eye, the interior, is has higher contrast and then that window is kind of diffuse mm -hmm. uh, so i guess my interpretation of it whoops went went more towards uh, a certain solidity of of the architecture as if i was actually there looking at it you know not letting the uh the camera's lens or the or the you know developing of the photograph change the lighting as as it may have done for brassai Beautiful color harmony. Thank you. Yeah, and now in this one, I, I always love the orange that Van Eyck places on the windowsill. I mean, I've used that in a couple different paintings, but I'll just show you one where it shows up. Um, and when I was in graduate school in Washington, DC, I, I think I probably learned as much from going to the museums as I did from being in, in the classroom. and. Um, I became just fanatical for a lot of Northern Renaissance painting and also for paintings in the Freer Gallery, which is uh, devoted to uh, Asian art, Asian and Middle Eastern art. But in this case, uh, this wasn't in, in the National Gallery, but I just, uh, I've always enjoyed uh, Van Eyck's uh, use of the, of the objects around uh, the wedding couple here, you know, the, the the sabot on the floor or whatever the whatever you call those shoes and uh, that orange in the window it just you know it's to me just wonderfully exotic and and at the same time it's it's so sensitively um i guess focused on the reality of our lives you know what you find in a room so whoops so this was uh my homage to uh to van eyck and the orange i guess this is a small painting. It's probably uh, 12 by 12 or something like that. And um, it's entirely made up, uh, even the orange. Uh, you know, I just kind of painted it as I thought I could see it, you know? And that was something else about the way I approached painting things that looked like they might actually exist or be real is I wanted to make, I wanted to let my memory uh, or believe in my memory to reconstruct a reality that might actually be convincing to someone. Um, today, that behavior goes on in, in the political arena in ways that I, I'm horrified to, <laughs> to, to uh, hear it or see it. But I think in art, that's something that's absolutely magical about uh, the visual arts is uh, at times, the what we see is almost so 
so strong in, in its uh, ability to touch us in a in a kind of thought way and and in, I would say an emotional way, an aesthetic emotional way that uh, we believe what we see. When, as Picasso said, it's it's a lie to make us realize the truth. Um, well, this is just, I don't really have anything more to say about this other than it looks Flemish to me, <laughs> but it's probably 1995 or something. I don't know. Um, I think there are just a couple more. Oh, uh, in the Freer Gallery in Washington, they had these beautiful uh, little uh, paintings um, by Bellini. Uh, this is a Turkish scribe. And uh, I had a postcard of it in my studio, and I uh, put it into this painting. This was one done in the mid '80s, um, and he's up on the wall there. Like this painting's called "Storm in the East," and it was actually like 1986 before they act, before Desert Storm even became a uh, an event in our lives. Uh, but at the time I painted it, I. I actually put crosshairs on the Bellini um, scribe up there just because I wanted to uh, elucidate the fact that that was uh, one of my major focuses as if I was seeing that as, as a spiritual target. <laughs> Although I'm afraid the crosshairs may be misinterpreted. Um, well, this uh, this was a mogul uh, miniature painting that I have in a portfolio that I've always uh, enjoyed. And I really liked Persian and uh, mogul painting. So I did a copy of it in graduate school when we were asked to uh, build a gesso panel and, and make our own tempera paint. So uh, this was not exactly what they thought I'd be doing. They thought I might be doing a Italian Renaissance tempera painting, but I did this instead. Um, so I carried it around with me for a number of years. And then I, uh, well, this, uh, you'll see. Uh, so those two images ended up in this painting. Uh, I actually uh, applied that small painting into this larger painting. It's eight feet by eight feet. Um, and it, it's uh, it's just kind of a fantasy, this whole thing of the chaos in my studio, which is on the easel, uh, the the working nature of this studio with the the ladder, the bucket of paint, the, the step stool, um, and then um, just, you know, a lot of different things fit into this um, that to me suggest art historical context. But you know, with the Warhol soup can, and um, that coupled with uh, the Mogul painting, you know, it's that's my world. You know, I'm I'm just looking all the time. Okay, well, that's that's all I have for the art history. So, enough of that. Um, well, I've got a couple other things. I don't know. Does anybody want to? direct the discussion. <laughs> um, oh, dot matrix. How would you like, would you like to see how I use a dot matrix printer in, in oil painting? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, here's, here's the old dot matrix printer. I don't have it anymore. Uh, I don't even think I'd have a computer that would accept it. Um, <laughs> but uh, so anyway, I would put uh, tracing paper into the dot matrix uh, printer and I would create these patterns that I was taking out of mogul miniature paintings, such as the floor in this one. And I would print the pattern. It was just in black and white. It was kind of like a tracing. Uh, and then I would cut it and paste it down and then paint over it uh, with glazes. and. Uh, Beyond that, I just created this mythical interior with what I think is a view of maybe Persia or something, uh, Afghanistan. I don't know. It's uh, it's to me, it's an it's a very exotic and rather um, uh, 
friendly, meditative kind of place. Um, it's not a very big painting. It's probably 15 by 20 or something like that. And you can see around the window, there's kind of a textural detail. And that's where mixed media starts. I, there's a certain amount of mixed media that I often will work with in paintings as well. Not, you know, not just using the dot matrix printer, but actually using uh, some other materials like wood or, or plaster or something like that. Again, it's the floor in this one. Um, this is on this is on uh, a, a piece of fired clay, and that the image of the landscape was a photograph I uh, took in Bologna, Italy, um, and so I just kind of painted from that. But then I created this strange sort of atrium-like uh, room uh, to. Um, to have that that aperture opening into the landscape, and and I again uh, created a pattern on my dot matrix printer and pasted it down, and then painted over it to make it look like uh, terrazzo um, tile. So it's on fired clay. It's probably about sixteen inches square. Uh, this is a mixture of both the dot matrix again on the floor, and then I'm using wood molding uh, for structure to the room. And then the, there's a small panel landscape that I plugged into it. So it, it's actually, uh, I was bringing things to the, the painting that uh, weren't already part of that surface. They, they were applied and, and glued down. Okay, well, that's, that's all I have on <laughs> mixed media. Um, uh, oh, I've lost myself here. Mm -hmm. um, well, here, okay. I'll just, I'll, I won't talk so much. I'll just run through. These are these are mixed media images. And if you want to stop me, please feel free. Um, can you see that? I not yet. Hmm. I can't see what happened to my screen. We can still see your screen. Oh, there it is. Okay. There we go. There we go. Uh, the mixed me on this is that building on the right has actually some plaster and and some wire mesh in it. Uh, this was something that was taken from maybe Vence or that little bit of landscape in the bottom was uh, an image maybe of Vence or one of the towns in uh, um, in the Midi. And then I just created a, a fake kind of fresco mural on the top there. But you can kind of see textural changes going on. Mm -hmm. uh, same sort of thing. The shelving on either side of the window opening or pieces of wood that were glued in and the floor has a little bit of texture. If I were to show it a bit larger, you, you could see that. And then across the top, there's some wood molding being used for architectural things. There's a, a place in, um, can't, it's in Mantua, it's called the Palazzo Te. It's on the on the road to Venice. And uh, you go into this place and there are these frescoes on the wall and they've all been gouged with graffiti from uh, maybe the Napoleonic Wars or something like that. I don't know, but you know, it's it was a desecration of beautiful artwork. And so I kind of appropriated that idea to this painting. Um, it's actually sort of in a little shadow box like effect. And I I pushed that door outward and put a mirror on the back of the door, or I put a pasted a picture of my stairs in my house on the back of the door. And then I put a mirror uh, in there as well to make it seem like there were stairs that go up. So you can kind of see there how the stairs are going up, but it's a very shallow space. It's mm -hmm. only uh, the depth of the painting itself is maybe an inch, you know, 
the shadow box is about an inch and a half deep or so. And then I, the studio that I had at the time is right next to these uh, rail lines. And I'd constantly see boxcars going by with all that graffiti on it. And so I, I sort of took that idea and painted graffiti of my own uh, kind of a 20th century into the, um, into the building or into the, uh, under the walls, you can kind of see it there. And it's got glass in front of it just because it's kind of a delicate uh, structure of things. Um, here, uh, this is sort of straightforward, but I was using uh, lead type to create the, uh, the effect of, you can see the number two is repeated up there. It's just lead type that I was using like a rubber stamp. Here I created some kind of uh, strange 3D effect on the floor. The tile actually is sort of made out of casting plaster with clay. I used uh, plastilina clay, which is something industrial designers use to make models for things. And it's got uh, some, maybe some wood molding up on the top. So it's, it's a very, it's a rather shallow bas relief painting. This is like a tabernacle painting. Um, and uh, you can see the, the wood molding that framers would use that does the surround on it. Why I do this is, I guess, just because I love to look at art. It goes back to maybe having to pull that Turner painting out of the bin at the Papa Tree Michel. <laughs> uh, this is a this painting's about four feet high, and uh, the only thing about it that's mixed media is this cushion over on the chair in the painting that's on the wall was actually a piece of linoleum that I glued down. Everything else is just kind of you know done with oil paint. This is another one of my fired ceramic slabs where I uh, actually kept that arched opening empty and I cut a piece of wood and then did a landscape painting and popped it in there. So it's kind of like an ornate architectural frame for the landscape. And these are just invented European landscapes, this one and that one. They're almost the same, but not exact. So. Well, I've been doing a lot of talking. How about some questions? Does anybody want to jump in? Well, first of all, thank you, Cole. It's so great to see all of your work. And I just love how you incorporate different materials and your travels. And I love, it seems like you're very interested in the structure and all these different um, influences. It's so cool to hear about everything that's influenced your work and how you've incorporated that into your into your painting. So thank you so much for giving us a little peek into your work and your insights and your influences and and all of that. Um, I know oh, some people may have to leave after the hour, but um, we can keep this going as long as we want. And I'm happy to help field questions. If anyone has questions, just feel free to either, you know, sort of put your hand up like this or just unmute yourself and go ahead and, and ask questions. I hope I didn't take the wind out of everybody's lungs or something. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, Question? Oh, 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 you go ahead, Barry. Cole, this um, may be a, a strange question, but uh, you've talked about two things related to AIDS and breast cancer. And I'm just wondering uh, the connection you make or don't make between art and social issues? Well, I think uh, there's a long history of art and social issues. Um, I mean, it's art has been used for propaganda, certainly. It's mm -hmm. used mm -hmm. for its decorative 
or spiritual uh, application in the in the form of murals and architecture. Certainly, churches with uh, the instruction of of religious doctrine. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, all the altar pieces, all the frescoes. You know, telling the biblical story and whatever. Um, you know, then we get into things like the 20th century and you have degenerative artists, uh, degenerate artists in, in Nazi Germany or, um, you know, causes today, like I was uh, relating to uh, breast cancer or to the AIDS epidemic. Um, you know, I, I think it's pretty hard for artists to work in a vacuum. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't try to paint things that are truly of a political nature or, or, you know, have propaganda to me, that's illustration. That's not right. what I consider to be art. Um, but I don't, and, and yet I don't believe an artist should be um, detached from humanity. So in the ways in which we can uh, apply our own humane or our humanistic sensitive uh, feelings about things and give them an aesthetic expression that um, Mm -hmm. perhaps transcends the, uh, the, what, what we're confronting in our own sort of mortal way um, is really the task of an artist. It's Mm. the realm of an artist. The, and thank God we have art and we have music to to fill us with with ways of of dealing with the those kinds of issues um, you know that are so prevalent uh, to our living. Mm. I don't know if that's a good answer to your question, but it's uh, it's it's excellent. Um, I really affirm that, and I think more of that should be. Uh, talked about to tell you the truth um, and that's what uh, you may know we're at the Marshall School we're doing this interface between the arts and peace building um, and uh, I think your statement there is just a reflection of how art takes us um, beyond ourselves you know, how we feel how we see what we hear and so forth uh, there's a certain responsibility there uh, in the social realm so thank you for that. Sure, John. Yeah, yeah Cole, I have a question, because I, uh, when, for instance, when you did this painting right here, there were a few before too, when you had the coats. It seems like you're, you know, you're so totally tied to sort of what you're, what you're looking at in the, in the visible world, but you're also thinking a lot too about different things and how things relate one, you know, what you're going to paint. So when you did this painting right here, did you set those things up with an idea or in mind, or was this something that you just walked into and saw and decided to paint it? Or did you set up the still life when you did it with the ideas in mind? Um, Well, here I'll, I'll, Make a little comment uh, that relates to to Leo's um, influence on me. I was riding in the school van that uh, they first had back in 1972, uh, and Leo's the trooper that he was. You know, there he was sitting in the back with about six of us, and we were running along these roads. And Leo says, "Look at that! Look at that! All you have to do through every window. There's there's a painting, you know, there, there's a landscape painting. Um, and that's, that's what charges me uh, often in, in my studio paintings is I just go into my studio and just start looking around and there might be something that intrigues me by, by its being there. And um, so I don't, I don't set things up because to me, setting up something is almost like going back to this idea of propaganda or, or, you know, it's, it's making something in, in a way untrue because it wasn't really part of our life. We, we, 
we constructed a, a, a falsehood or whatever. Um, that's not to say that a, a painting of a, you know, like those Dutch paintings of flowers and vases, or, or you know, if you get a Renoir painting of, of flowers, that he set that up and painted it. That's not to say it, it doesn't have its a beauty of sorts, but what drives me is is just finding the life that's around me. And in this painting here, uh, this is my palette. Uh, this is my work table. I mean, I was working on that table while I was painting it. I was things were getting moved around. They weren't there. They were there. Uh, they got cleaned up. They got scraped off. Um, but for the most part, the tables stood where they were, and I just used, that's what I used to work on. And then the, the plastic that's over the window was there because it was wintertime, and I was just trying to keep the place as warm as I could. So um, <laughs> I painted this corner of my studio 20 times at least. Um, and this one is called Winter's Breath because uh, the plastic over the windows would still get air coming through it and it would blow it out like a bellows. And that was fascinating to me. So how do I paint that plastic? And how do I how do I paint all these objects on the table? And how do I get the reflection on that jar, on that bottle of liquid that's standing there? Um, to me, that's something about using my eyes and trying to understand what I'm seeing and, and find a way to, um, make the paint, make it happen. So, you know, it's a little bit of wanting to, to get at the essence of, of, a, of a visual truth and at the same time express something that's common and, and not necessarily what people would think of as beautiful, but I think it is. So that's why I do it. Um, these are all paintings related to, to the window motif that, that, Leo alluded to when we were rocking around in the van and he said, look through any of these windows and you've got subject matter. So, you know, I, I took that to heart. This is the same corner of the studio as uh, the one that had the plastic over the window, only now it's summertime. So that's kind of how that, that fits in. It's so interesting to me too that you're incredible master of texture you know in the in the interiors you're you're uh very much sort of tied to the texture of you know each thing on the inside and a little bit less so in the in the landscapes it's really, i find that interesting too well i i could put up paintings i've done just of tree bark but I, I didn't include any of those. Um, but, you know, maybe that would be for another time. But, you know, like here's a landscape out the window. Uh, and this was a setup. I, I had the coffee cup and the saucer and I set it on the window. And, and I looked through this window to this building in the distance that was being constructed. And this is, again, this fabulous light that we, we get. And... Um, yeah, the textures in the landscape, how do you paint a billion leaves, you know? I mean, I'm not going to sit there and fuss over each leaf. So it, it, for me, it's it's tonal approximation as best as I can make it. Um, and just as the reflection on the dark side of, on the darker side of this tea cup or this coffee cup, you know, how do I get the, the light that's actually there in the shadow? Um, you know, there's no, that was another thing uh, Leo said, you you can't teach us how to paint, he can teach us how not to paint. And I think what he was really saying is just look, just learn to see and you'll find your way if you pay attention. And um, so, you know, I didn't have a course on how to glaze or how to uh, put in grounds or even how to put paint on my palette. I mean, I've seen people that put paint on a palette in such an orderly way that I, I feel like they're going to serve it for dinner. But, um, you know, I we all have to find our own way. And for me, it, it is looking at textures. Um, it's fascinating to me.
or looking at the scrim-like quality of a, of a sheer curtain. And here, here's Van Eyck again, uh, times three. But hey, um, yeah, I'm sorry, what'd you? Aaron, that's a, do you have a question? No, well, not so much a question as an observation. What I'm finding really interesting in your work is something that's always kind of intrigued me or attracted me is where there's kind of an intersection between different types of painting, like like still lives that are actually interiors as well as a still life, or an interior that looks out at the landscape. So it's 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 using elements of both. And I think especially where the still life that appears to be, even if it's not, but appears to be just found objects sitting there in front of you that you looked up and saw and wanted for one reason or another to, to paint, that kind of gives, gives a, 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 what am I trying to say? It, it lends credence to it being a particular moment in time and place that, you know, that I, I, I'm also attracted to that I think it's Van Gogh who said something along the lines of capturing what doesn't pass away and what passes away. And so I think when there's those elements that relate to a greater whole, I guess, that encompasses our lives, I'm running out of steam here. But anyway, I was finding that very interesting in your work. And I also really liked the sink paintings, having done many years ago, a, a series of what I referred to as sink paintings, which I admit I did out of some sense of boredom in a, in a class that I was taking, but it was one, it was again, it was just an array of found objects that found their way to these sinks and the juxtaposition in, in my case of colors and, and neutrals was just really interesting to explore. So I related to your sink paintings as well. Anyway, thank you. It's been very interesting. Yeah, thanks. I, yeah, I, I would agree with you that everything that's around us has is there to to be uh, participate in our life. And um, as an artist, I guess I'm trying to point out by what I paint that that's that if we open our eyes and, and look at things, we might find pleasure in the in the, the dumbest arrangement of or the dumbest array of things that are just strewn across a table um, because life goes on and that's that's just part of our life, just like time goes on. So um, as a segue to just the notion of time, this painting is called Seven Minutes for the Sun. And that's how long it takes for the energy of, of light em emitted by the sun to reach the earth. You know, it, it travels through through all that distance at uh, 186,000 miles per second or something like that. So I was fascinated by the sunlight on this shade that was there and it and the warmth that it was giving me. And it and it was for me just, you know, just taking that moment to to appreciate it. And then try to immortalize it somehow. So now going back to the, I think, was it John, were you talking about the, the, the matter of, um, I don't know, not storytelling, but uh, social, social causes and things like that in a painting? That, um, was, that was me. That was Barry. Barry. Barry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I mistook you for John Gasprack. Um, sorry, <laughs> that happens. <laughs> I haven't seen you guys in so long. I, I'm just guessing. Um, anyway, Barry, this this painting was a very early one for me. It was, I think I did it maybe in 1983, and um, there used to be on milk cartons images of missing children, and it just was so upsetting you'd go buy a half gallon of milk and there'd always be a picture of a child that was missing. Mm. And um, I don't know. I just, I, I put this little image of, of off of one of those milk can milk cartons in the corner of that table or the lower right corner of the painting. And then um, 
I remember growing up, uh, my grandfather, who I never knew, had um, had a gas station uh, in Pittsburgh during the Depression, and a, a, what was left of um, well, there was a gun that was in our house. Uh, there was in a cloth sack on the third floor in a closet, um, and I guess he when he would. Uh, take money from his gas station and deposit it at the bank, he, he felt he needed protection because people were desperate. So as a child, I remember going up to the third floor and actually looking at this gun, you know, and I could have blown my head off, but you know, my, my I never did because I was told that guns are always loaded and, you know, you respect them. But for some reason, I, I remembered that and I put the gun in the painting, you know, I just, but I, you know, it was not really about being a child and remembering the gun as, as it was this problem of, of violence in our society. And this painting to me speaks of that in ways that are really um, subversive almost. Uh, this separation of space is, is jagged on a diagonal from the left, lower left to the upper right. And there's this kind of balance uh but it's an aggrieved balance between the upper left and the lower right areas you know they're they're kind of uh, separated and and uh, yet at the same time in a, in a kind of equilibrium or something like that and i don't know it it, it was a early painting and for some reason i i think the those children on the milk carton just kind of made me do this painting but it wasn't as if i had a plan it just happened and um i don't know what more can i say <laughs> well said thank you so there's there's one of that yeah i think since we're getting close to um well, 11.30, my time here on the West Coast, I might have us wrap things up here. Um, maybe we can all do a little virtual round of applause for Cole for sharing his story and his work with us. It's been so enjoyable, Cole. Thank you so much for sharing oh. all of this with us and, and showing us your work. It's really inspirational. Um, so wonderful. And um, so I will wrap things up here, but I'll keep the Zoom open. And um, if people want to chat or ask more questions to Cole, we can keep going. But I think I'll um, I'll wrap things up if people have to sign off. And um, a big thank you to Cole for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Thank you all for taking time out of your lives to uh, be with me for all of this. I hope I <laughs> didn't uh, get you too wound up in, in a lot of verbiage, but. Not at all. Thank you. So, so Thank beautiful, you. Cole. I Thank really you. enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Hi, Liz. <laughs> Hi, Cole. Great to see you. Thank you so much. Really interesting and fun to see your work. Well, yeah, it, it goes in a lot of different directions, which makes me seem like I'm definitely ADD, but, oh, you know, well, nice we're thing. all in that club. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, well, thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much, Thank you. I have a question. Will this be recorded? We can watch again or? Yes, definitely. So I will email all of you the recording once it's ready and it'll be on our YouTube channel so you can share it or rewatch re it. Um, so look out for an email from me either later today or tomorrow okay, with the link you. for the recording. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you all for joining Thank as you, well. Rose. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye, Sam.